Hello everyone, my name is Joe Brennan. I'm the Technical Manager at UK Flammelers with the Trade Association for the UK milling industry. In this quick presentation, I'm going to cover why ergot matters to the milling industry, um, the behaviour of this fungal disease, what growers can do to manage it, as well as touch on some of the, the research gaps and, and the areas where, where further work is needed. I'm aware that the, the growers you advise are not just growing wheat, um, and ergot does infect other cereals, which I'll touch on, but, but wheat's really going to be the main focus of this presentation. So what do I mean when I say a bad ergot trip? Well, as many growers will know, mills in the UK have pretty strict tolerances for ergot in grain, um, with, with many having a zero tolerance for any de detected sclerotia in the in the load at intake. So a bad trip in that context is sending grain to a mill and, and having it rejected for ergot costs time and money for everyone. Uh, but with ergot, there's a second meaning here too, which is that if you eat enough sclerotia um, and you would need to eat some, some seriously infested grain, uh, you could find yourself hallucinating, and, and that's because um, the sclerotia contain mycotoxins called ergot alkaloids, which, which in addition to being toxic, they have a hallucinogenic effect. I'm not going to advocate that anyone takes ergot to relax on the weekend, because the, the symptoms you'll get before hallucinating would be a loss of blood flow to your extremities, which can lead to extreme pain, necrosis and gangrene. So, so clearly they're quite serious mycotoxins. So why do uh, why does ergot matter to the milling, milling industry? Well, as I just mentioned, the the chemicals within ergot sclerotia have a, a toxic effect if they're consumed in enough uh, quantity, and as such, the the European Commission uh, have introduced a series of ergot limits affecting grain and grain based products. The the first was a, a reduction in the 0.05% sclerotia limit that applies to to unprocessed cereals that was dropped down to 0 0.2% 0 0.02%. Uh, and the second and the most significant from a milling industry perspective, at least, was the, the introduction of an ergo alkaloid limit in flour. The, the difficulty here is that the ergo alkaloid limit in flour was set very low relative to the levels of the mycotoxins that, that are found in the sclerotia themselves. So, so, so to illustrate that, you know, if you take a standard size wheat ergo sclerotia, research found that that can contain 1.8 million parts per billion ergo alkaloids. Whereas the, the limit set in white flour is 100 parts per billion, and that's going to go down even lower. It's going to drop down to 50 parts per billion by, by July 2024. So it's a quite a disparity between the levels you find in sclerotia versus the, the limits that are, are set in flour. So that really highlights the, the need to control ergot. It is a food safety issue, and, and even small quantities of the sclerotia can, can lead to elevated levels in the flour that could then go on to exceed those limits. So that's why so many mills set quite strict ergot limits. Many have their set at a zero tolerance, so any sclerotia will result in a rejection. Others have very low limits, for example, 0.01%. I should emphasize at this point that these mycotoxin limits are EU limits, um, so they affect flour and flour-based products sold to EU member states and also into to Northern Ireland. For UK mills, that's quite a significant proportion of, of flour demand, um, and many customers in the UK will, will set their specifications in line with EU limits anyway. Um, and, and the Food Standards Agency and, and Food Standards Scotland, they're, they're currently considering the approach that will be taken in, in GB. So although these are EU limits, they are affecting um, mill and, and mill customer specifications and that need to be looked at. Somewhat worryingly for ergot, we, we've seen two bad years in a row, uh, which hasn't really been the case previously. And, and there's some concern that the issue is getting worse and worse and compliance with the limits will get harder and harder. So, so that's why ergot is important to millers, but for now on to its, its behaviour as a fungal disease. So in the UK, uh, cases of ergot are caused by the fungi Claviceps purpurea. And the disease begins when fungal spores infect the florets of host plants, and these are, are flowering grasses, including many cereals. Those spores then proliferate into fungal structures within the developing grain, um, and they go on to produce a, a sticky honeydew that contains more secondary spores and, and causes more infections in, in plants nearby. So the insects are attracted to the honeydew and they transfer spores from one plant to another. Uh, and rain splash can also transfer spores in the honeydew from, from one plant to another nearby. So eventually those infection sites will develop into the ergot sclerotia themselves. And these are the dark purple blackish grain like structures you, you'll be familiar with. The, the sclerotia that are in the crop, they're either harvested alongside the grain or they fall off at some point and, and lie dormant in the soil. In the soil, these sclerotia can remain viable for up to a year 
So next season they germinate and, and release spores again and, and thereby restart the infection cycle. So what are the risk factors for ergot? Well, you need ergot sclerotia in your, in your seed or your soil or your grass margins as, as the source of the spores for the infection. The weather conditions aren't fully understood, um, but wet weather triggers sclerotia germination and the infection of, of uh, grasses happens during flowering. So wet weather during the flowering period uh, is likely to result in an infection if, if sclerotia is present in the soil. I have to say, though, that does seem a bit peculiar this season because uh, for much, much of the country, there's been very dry weather during the flowering period. And that's been reflected in the very low levels of fusaria mycotoxins we're seeing this year, but high levels of ergot are still being seen. So it's a bit of a head scratcher there, really. But as infection happens during the flowering period, it, it's thought that varieties with a longer flowering period are, are more susceptible. Um, spring wheats are also more susceptible, and, and that's thought to be due to the timing of their flowering period and possibly the more open floret structure those varieties tend to have as well. Uh, late tillering varieties are also thought to be more susceptible, as are crops with secondary tillers, because there's a, a wider window for the ergot sp spores to infect florets. Grass weeds are a major factor, um, as many species like black grass are excellent hosts, and, and they can lead to secondary infections within the crop itself. Um, but can also produce small ergot sclerotia that can contaminate the harvest crop and, and lead to rejections themselves too. Now, some research found that, that grasses and field margins didn't have a significant impact on ergot infection, um, but a small risk is posed as, as these can become infected and act as a, as a reservoir of secondary infections in, in the field itself. Other planted cereals uh, can be vulnerable to ergot too. Rye, for example, is, is very susceptible to ergot, and um, although not much is grown in the UK, as I understand it, triticale also appears to be quite vulnerable to infection. Barley and oats can also develop ergot, but they do appear to be slightly less susceptible to the disease than wheat. We covered the risk factors, um, now about managing ergot. So unfortunately in the UK, there is no chemical control for this disease. Uh, a product was released in, in Canada last year, which is a mix of uh, fluopyram, tepiconazole and, and prothiconazole. Uh, and that's the, the first folium fungicide marketed with ergot suppression on, on the label. Um, all those actives are approved for use in, in GB, so it'll be interesting to see if there's something like that that will get uh, approved and marketed here. There are some uh, seed treatments with some broad spectrum fungicide activity that can suppress the germination of ergot particles in contaminated seed stocks, uh, and that will prevent an ergot problem starting in the field if you don't already have one. However, as I mentioned in, in the risk factors, um, the, uh, the ergot sclerotia already in the soil from, from the previous crop or, or sclerotia in grass margins can still provide uh, a source of infectious spores for, for the planted crop. Um, so, so in light of the relatively sparse chemical control available, the, the main control recommendations relate to crop husbandry and, and trying to minimise the risk factors for the, for the formation and germination of sclerotia. So firstly, it's, it's important to understand um, where the ergot affects the farm. Uh, it appears to be quite a localised disease and you can have fields close to one another that have varying levels of ergot infection. And uh, as the sclerotia in the soil are the, the overwinter reservoir of, of spores for new infections, that's quite an important consideration in, in terms of, of mapping infections and, and targeting uh, the future control measures. So beginning with, with crop and variety selection, um, there's, there's no completely ergot resistant varieties, um, but if you have an ergot problem on your farm, then the uh, available research suggests that, that spring wheats really should be avoided as, as these are more susceptible to infection. In terms of choosing within the winter wheats, uh, it's a bit of a harder decision. There are some differences in susceptibility on the basis of the flowering period, but at this moment in time, they, they don't appear to be that well uh, catalogued, at least for the winter wheat varieties. Rye is, is somewhat uh, infamous for its susceptibility to ergot, so if, if growers are having ergot problems, they should consider whether, whether drilling rye is the right option for them or, or if they'll be adding to the the reservoir of sclerotia and spores in that field. Uh, it isn't just uh, this year's crop, but, but the next year's that has to be thought about too. Seed should ideally be free from ergot. Um, if you've got ergot in your seed, then you're just reintroducing a source of inoculum for the crop. Uh, if, if you're using farm safe seed and have had, had, have had an ergot issue, then um, 
you may want to consider cleaning the seed or, or you just risk repeating it. Uh, but having said that, ergot is permitted in, in certified seed. You know, you can have up to uh, three pieces per 500 grams as, as per the minimum regulatory standard uh, and one piece per kilo in the higher voluntary standard. Some question marks there really, you know, although we're talking about seed and, and not grain, it does seem peculiar to allow a relatively, uh, relatively high level of sclerotia to be introduced with the seed and, and reintroduce a, a source of spores there too. Uh, other aspects from a variety selection perspective are, are grass margins, um, where, where growers really should opt for, for sowing later flowering grass species that would be less likely to act as, as sources of secondary infection for the main crop. As I mentioned earlier, many grass weeds are good ergot hosts and, and thereby they act as, as sources of infection in the field. Black grass in particular has a susceptibility to ergot, although no doubt growers will be tackling that already because of the, the negative impact of yield. But really just emphasising that controlling grass weeds is, is key here, not just in terms of protecting yield in general, but also the, the food safety aspect of, of potential ergot infections too. Um, if there if there is an ergot issue, it, it is the case that ergot doesn't infect non-cereal crops. Um, so these should be considered as options in, in fields where, where ergot has been a problem in order to provide a, a break in the infection cycle. Another option is to, to plough the, the sclerotia in at a depth of at least five centimetres. That way they, they can't germinate next season and, and infect the new crop in the field. Uh, in heavily infested areas, it, it could be appropriate to, to harvest headlands and tramlines separately as the, the later tillers are more likely to be infected and, and contaminated with sclerotia. It's then crucial to store that grain separately from the rest of the crop and, and consider options for, for cleaning it. So if you have ergot in your, in your harvested grain, then really there need to be careful considerations of, of what to do with it. As I mentioned earlier, ergot is a food safety issue and, and many mills in the UK have uh, very strict limits for sclerotia. It's vital to know your market and, and have an understanding of, of whether your grain is contaminated with ergot and that, that ties back to the, the farm mapping of in, infections again uh, as part of the approach to, to tackling this. If you know that your local markets have a, a low or zero tolerance for ergot, then it's wise to get the grain cleaned and, and avoid that risk of a, of a costly rejection and all the faff that entails. Many meals do have colour sorters that are, are quite effective at removing sclerotia, uh, but, but the problem is that when the sclerotia are in the grain and the pile is disturbed, for example, when, when loading and unloading, the sclerotia break into smaller fragments and dust which, which contaminate the grain but are much harder to be cleaned out. As I mentioned earlier, you've got very high concentrations of the alkaloids in the sclerotia, so even uh, sclerotial dust can elevate, elevate uh, got alkaloid levels quite significantly. Um, so as such, it's quite important to try and remove the sclerotia as early as possible and, and before the grain is disturbed too many times. But it's also the case that we shouldn't be overly reliant on cleaning uh, and minimising the disease in the field really should be a priority. And that's because uh, the evidence shows that ergot infection uh, contaminates the, the rest of the grain in the ear with ergot alkaloids. So visually, these grains appear completely normal, but they have within them elevated levels of ergot alkaloids and, and those can't be cleaned out. So it's so a risk factor there. But really, the key message there is, is to make sure you know your market requirements. If your end users don't accept grain with ergot, do you want to be risking a rejection for a food safety issue? So as I mentioned at the start, um, ergot appears to be, be becoming an increasingly common issue. Now we've had two bad years uh, for this disease in a row. Uh, quite unfortunate really, because that's happening just as, as very strict limits for ergot alkaloids have been introduced. So further research into this disease and its management is, is gonna be crucial. Obviously there's a range of, uh, of crop husbandry guidance that the growers are given, uh, but the options aren't gonna be appropriate for all farms. For example, if you're if you're opting for a, a min-till setup, you're not really gonna wanna be plowing the sclerotia into the soil. And we've heard of that agrochemical that's been released in, in Canada that specifically mentions ergot control. And hopefully something like that will be feasible for the UK market as well to, to give growers a bit more flexibility when it comes to tackling disease. I mentioned variety selection earlier too. You know, is there enough being done to understand the, the range in ergot resistances across the varieties in the market now? Um, is that something that should be considered within the, the recommended list? 
uh, we'll first need a better understanding of the resistances as they stand and, and whether the differences across them are, are significant enough. And uh, if those differences are very small and, and actually the resistance of the elite varieties isn't as good as it could be, do we need to start looking to bring resistance genes into wheat breeding programs to, to start future proofing varieties joining the market? Are those resistance genes even identified yet or, or, or does that work need to be done too initially? Does there also need to be uh, a reconsideration of the seed standards and, and the permitted levels of ergot within those? Really, we should be aiming for, for as low levels of sclerotia in certified seed as possible, because you know what, what's the point of the good husbandry if, uh, if ergot and, and the spores are just being introduced with the seed anyway? Those risk factors we covered earlier too, and you have wet weather at flowering supposed to be a key risk factor, but then we're also seeing this high level of ergot this season uh, when that period was was remarkably dry for much of the country. So understanding those aspects a bit better will, will help us develop uh, predictive models so, so growers can know better when ergot will be more of a risk for them in, in a season and they can prepare for that. So it's so really start incorporating more of those IPM principles into ergot control too. I think as well it'd be good to have uh, a better understanding of, of why the, the prevalence of ergot is increasing. You know, looking at farms uh, that have particular issues, for example, I know coming from the milling side of things that could sound a bit accusatory, but we really want this to be collaborative. You know, we we need to understand ergot better and we really as a chain need to work together to tackle this and and understand anything in the agronomy of farms that are having particular issues and, and see if there are any common causes that, that haven't been identified previously. You know, is it due to newer varieties? Is it due to the prevalence of black grass or, or the loss of oil seed rape on, on some farms as a non-cereal break crop. Building that knowledge will, will really help us all tackle it better in the future. And I'd like to end by just reminding everyone again that, that ergot is a food safety issue. You know, grain that contains ergot isn't being rejected for the sake of it, um, but mills are doing this because they need to, to minimise the levels of ergot alkaloid uh, mycotoxins in, in the food they produce. Um, so, so, yeah, as a chain, we, we really need to think about what we can do to, to address this issue as it does appear to be increasing in prevalence. So lastly, thank you all for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. My, my email is on this slide and my, my business card can be accessed with this QR code. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Goodbye. Well, unfortunately, in the